Shalom, brothers and sisters and family. Shalom. Welcome to another Sabbath day. This is your host, Jeremiah Israel. Greetings. For those who are new to my channel, uh, don't forget to like and subscribe. For those who are visiting, don't forget to like my channel, my page. Uh, for those that you, that you, uh, for the classes that you like. This is a teaching ministry. Uh, don't come on here and uh, rant about, uh, you know, what happened yesterday and, you know, how I was raised, raising hogs and all that other crazy stuff. I don't do that kind of stuff. So uh, it's going to be a, a ministry that you're going to have some, you're going to get educated. You're going to learn something. So for those who like to support this ministry, the gathering of our nation together, not in the camp, but as the Most High God said in, in Jeremiah 29 and 5, build ye houses, which means build you a community and live therein. Plant ye gardens and eat the food that eat the fruit thereof. You know, build your community and grow your own food. You know, we need to be doing something to get out the way because of what's coming. We don't need to be in the way when Christ returned, thinking that the bombs and all of the, all of that fire is gonna miss us while we stand in the way, being nosy. He told us to get out the way, build your own community. If you look look at this Bible from ex, from uh, from Genesis to Exodus Exodus on to when the Most High God made a covenant with us, even when we're in slavery. First thing he told Moses to do was to tell Pharaoh to let my people go three days journey into the wilderness so that they can worship me. Most like God don't want us worshiping him around the enemy. Anyway, if you would like to support this ministry, I just just finished purchase uh, I just finished a new book, Friendship Matters. It's available paperback, ebook. And hardback. Also, also, Genesis the beginning. Also available. Ebook, paperback, and hardback. Blood of the Covenants. It's a book about the old and new covenant. You know, get some of the confusion out of the way between. The covenant is because there, there is a lot of confusion. Understanding the parables of Jesus Christ. Now, you know, I've been seeing online lately there's a lot of Hebrews that don't really believe in the New Testament. You know, you're going to be those ones saying, well, be saying, Lord, Lord. I, I feel sorry for you in that day. Study Guide for the Kingdom, Volume 1. All of these books are written in Jeremiah Israel. Now, uh, the rest of my books are written in my given name because I was writing books before I changed my name. Prophets of Israel. If you want to get an understanding of the prophets of what the Most High God sent the prophets to do in their timeline, that would be a great book to get. The Holy Spirit Teaches. These are the things that when you know you receive the Holy Ghost, you know, when you when you believe that Christ has died for the sake of your sins so that you can live and have everlasting life and and have faith in Christ and, and keeping the commandment of the Most High God, you will have some, you will read these scriptures and the Holy Spirit would teach you a few things about this Bible. Hebrew instruction manual. Still continuation of what the Holy Spirit teaches you. All of these are uh, uh, all these books were written out of the Bible. And I have I have five or six more of the books that I've written that have that, that are not here. So feel free to go to Amazon.com and search these books.
Go to Amazon.com and search these books. Uh, feel free to buy one, two, buy as many as you like. But anyway, all your support will be appreciated. And all praises to the Most High. Shalom, Israel. This includes you so called blacks, Hispanics, and Native Americans. Those of the diaspora dispersed throughout the Americas, Africa, India, Europe, Asia, and the islands. Those of the sub Saharan and the transatlantic slave trade. My topic today is a continuation from last week Understanding Apostle Paul. This is part two. Uh, we, we, we stopped off. Uh, Jesus was not the only man to be crucified. There's a source that I will probably uh, have on my. Uh, Leave with this lesson. The most famous crucifixion in the world took place when, according to the New Testament, Jesus was put to death by the Romans. But well, he was far from the only person who perished on the cross. In antiquity, thousands upon thousands of people were crucified which at the time was considered to be one of the most brutal and shameful ways to die. In Rome, the crucifixion process was a long one, entailing scourging. More on that later. Before the victim was nailed and hung from the cross, the practice became especially popular in the Roman-occupied Holy Land in 4 BC. The Roman general Varus crucified 2,000 Jews and there were mass crucifixions during the first century A.D. According to the Roman Jewish historian Josephus, Christ was crucified on the pretext that he was instigated rebellion against Rome on the par with zealous and other political activists. The authors wrote in the report, I wonder how many followers of Christ did Saul of Tarsus lead to their death on the cross. Because this was the this was the norm for black folks. Now, Roman citizen, you could not crucify on the cross. That means white folks could not be crucified on the cross. Only Jews and, and other nations were, were the ones being crucified. Mostly Jews. If not crucified, being entertained some other way. fact is, when you read this Bible, you begin to understand your enemy, which is still around you today, who is brutal as all get out, has, has been brutal toward us, towards us forever. Now, because they, they, they can empty a clip in you just to watch you die. It, it, it never gets old to them. But for some reason, I, I, I don't understand why most of y'all want to still sit around this man. Oh, he cool as he's cool as the other side of the fan as long as you don't have a mindset that's of your own. Now, when you have your, a, a mindset of your own, you're no longer his friend. You're his enemy, and his, his, his hatred towards you goes off the rails. I just don't understand. You know, you, you know, he don't, he don't do, he don't do the Japanese man like that, or the Chinese man like that, or the Arab man like that. But for some reason, his hatred towards you, and, and all of them are that way. They cool with you as long as they, you, you're on their side and you doing business with them and you friendly with them. But if you decide you want to stick up your your shop and close your shop with them and go do business with somebody else. They can empty a whole clip in you and watch you die. Have they, they wouldn't feel no remorse. Acts 9 and 3. And desired of him letters to Damascus, to, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this of this any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound into Jerusalem. This was uh, this was Saul of Tarsus, our uh, Apostle Paul. Now, 
the previous lesson, the previous lesson, X, let's 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 start at X uh nine and did I, did I do nine and one? Yeah, let's let's start at X nine and one. Acts 9 and 1, and Saul yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went into the high priest. Now Saul was vicious against, against the, uh, he was vicious against the followers of Christ. He was threatening to kill and all kinds of stuff, kill him and everything. Acts 9 and 2, and desired of him letters to Damascus. He wanted the letters of Damascus because he knew somebody had letters that they were going, they were going to Damascus. He desired those letters. He wanted those letters. And desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogue, that if he found any of the any of this way. Whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound into Jerusalem. Because he found letters that they were going to Damascus, he was going to take them all. Whether they were men or women, he was going to bring them to Jerusalem, bound up. Bring them to Jerusalem for what? To see that white man, the chief priest, who appointed the high priest and all of that. You know, we didn't, you know, like Agrippa. A was appointing the high priest during this time for the Jews in Jerusalem. So imagine that. If, if, if he wasn't a Jew, he had to be doing the will of the Romans. He wasn't working for the, for the uh, commonwealth of Israel. At this time, Apostle Paul wasn't even working for the commonwealth of Israel. For those who are questioning the letters of the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, do you think these books would survive the onslaught of the Roman Empire and the leaders of the Jews? Now, this is this is the, the dilemma, you know, because a lot, a lot of people want to be saints and want to be into this Bible and want to be trying to get understanding, but they don't understand the, the, the history of of the things that was going on back then. The Jews themselves were not friendly to Christ and his followers. Now, if they would have found letters of Christ, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and all of these other uh, writers that were scribing uh, uh, letters and stuff uh, for, uh, for, for these disciples, they would have burned those up because they were still set on the old covenant ways. Acts 9, okay, Acts 26 and 10. Which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from who? The chief priests. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. Now, Apostle Paul was not talking about Christ. He was talking about after Christ died, all the people, all the people who believed on Christ, all the people who, all the, all the people of the church who believed in Christ, he was putting them to death. He was putting those people to death, chasing them down. Apostle Paul himself testified of how he pursued Christ's church under the authority of the chief priests who were more than likely Edomites or Hebrews in favor of the Roman Empire. He imprisoned many of them. And when they were possibly crucified, put to death, he would speak against them. You know, that's, you know, the fact is, you know, there's a saying, you don't, you don't speak ill of the dead. Apostle Paul didn't give that give a, a darn about them when they died. He spoke even worse. 
Acts 26 and 11. And I punished them off in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme, blaspheme and bring and being exceedingly mad against them, I persecute them even into strange cities. Apostle Paul went into the synagogue, beat the crap out of them, made them blaspheme. Tell you, say you don't believe in Christ. You know, just say you don't believe in Christ. Beat the hell out of them. Made them lie. And he chased them down. He said, in strange cities, strange cities mean cities that was not under the Roman Empire. He didn't give two, two darns about it because the fact is, he had the nation of Rome behind him. When you don't care, you 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 run into another man's territory because your, your, your daddy is so big that they be scared to touch you. Acts 26 and 12, whereupon as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests. Saul of Tarsus was still doing the work under the Roman Empire which the chief priests represented. How many present day Israelite leaders are under the hand doing the works of the American government against their own people? I can safely say the majority of them are not working on behalf of their own people. For example, many Israelites that are in entertainment are working for the American government, pushing their agenda in the music and movies, pushing out pushing out negative movie and music, which is not a positive Israelite influence. They not they not doing things positively for the Commonwealth of Israel. First Corinthians fifteen thirty three, be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Our leaders are doing the our, our leaders are doing what the enemy designed for them. Our leaders are doing what the, are doing what the enemy designed for them. Keeping them wicked. Saul of Tarsus was, was led to Christ by the Most High God. John 6 and 44. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. And I will raise him up at the last day. All of, all of this wickedness that Saul of Tarsus was doing against Christ's church, the Most High God of Israel chose him and led him to Christ. For all of Saul's transgression, he was worthy of death. However, the Most High had mercy on whoever he pleased. The, the Most High have mercy on whoever he pleases. Exodus 33 and 19. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. And will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. So the Most High God would have mercy on whoever He wants to have mercy. It don't matter your sins, your transgressions. If He cho chooses you, He chooses you under His own mercy. Matthew twenty-two and fourteen: For many are called, but few are chosen. A Hebrew, a Hebrew may be called, but his heart which is his mind, still is not right. He or she may be still straddling the fence between the Most High God and the world. Acts 26 and 13. At midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. He said, I saw this light and the people that were with me saw it. Some people could see this light shining about, knowing something is happening that is not ordinary. And they will question what is happening, go consume some alcohol or smoke a blunt, and that event has already escaped their thoughts. Oh, you know.
Yeah, there was some trickery in the sky, that's all it was. Saul of Tarsus was confronted by Christ, a God whose church he was destroying. Acts 26, 14. And when, he, and when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why well, you wouldn't say it in the Roman tongue, in Latin? See, these are, things, these are subtle things that the Bible shows you that if you don't pick up on, you, you would be fooled to think that, that these were white folks. Saul was a Hebrew. Apostle Paul was a Hebrew. Blackest, blackest ace of spade. They thought he was a, a, a they thought he was a, 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 what they thought he was a, they thought he was a burnt face of an Ethiopian guy. Christ, a God, does not have to throw one punch, shoot one bullet, or swing one sword to subdue any earthly vessel. He and his Father controls all things, and Christ lets Saul know that fighting against him is like kicking against the pricks. You're only injuring yourself. That's what, that's what Christ was telling him here in Acts 26 and 14. And when, and when we were all falling to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks because you're going to hurt yourself. You, you ain't doing nothing hurting yourself. Acts 26 and 15. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. The thing about Saul is he had a zeal for the Most High. Don't thought that he was doing the right thing, but when he was shown the light, he righted his court. He righted his course without questioning. See, that's all Christ had to do is show him the way. Show him the light. You you going to you you on the wrong path, dude. Romans 10, 20, 10 and 2. For I bear them record that they may have a that they have a zeal of God but not according to knowledge. Apostle Paul, which was Saul then, fully understood how having a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge, could put one in error. He was zealous, chasing the followers of Christ, thinking that he was righteous in doing so. There are many Hebrews today who have the same zeal, but not according to the scriptures. Acts 26 and 16. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister, a servant, and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of these things in the which I will appear unto thee. So you're going to be a minister for the things that you see and the things I'm going to show you. This is extremely significant what Christ told Saul of Tarsus. First Christ told Saul that he appointed him as a minister. Apostle Paul is a minister to his people. Christ told Apostle Paul to establish his church. He told him to be a minister to his people. A minister is more than a title. It is explained in the following precepts. Matthew 20 and 25. But Jesus called them unto him and said, Ye know that the prince of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. Yeah, you, you like, you see like the, the Roman governors and all of this stuff, they exercise dominion, because they can, they can kill you at will. When Hebrew finally decided to come from among them, they should not establish their kingdom like their enemies who have dominion over the people. The Israelites do not like our enemies dominating us today. Then they should, then why should we want to dominate our own people? How did Christ feel about setting up our nation in the same fashion? 
Matthew 20 and 26. But it shall not be so among you. Okay, I don't want y'all doing that. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. Okay. Let him be your minister. You know, you, who be great among you? No, Christ is going to tell you what minister means in a, in a second. Precept must be upon precept. Precept upon precept. Christ did not want his followers to establish the church having dominion over his people, like most of you Hebrew camps do. Like most of y'all do. While most Hebrew camps, Christian churches, all of y'all, you can't even go talk to T.D. Jakes unless you got at least a grand in your hand. Unless you polish him with, you can't, you can't have a dinner with him unless you, you're paying $5,000 just to sit down and have dinner with him. Christ did not want his followers to establish the church having dominion over his people. While the churches of today established contrary to what Christ told his disciples, they use the name of Jesus Christ, but they do not follow his ways. Are they worshiping the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the Christ of the King James Version 1611 Bible? I don't think so. Matthew 20 and 27. Let's see what minister means. And whosoever would be chief among you, let him be your servant. That's what minister means. Do these so-called Christian pastors, ministers, reverends, and bishops serve their people or themselves? All of the money that they have collected does not go to serving their people. The most High God established in his law how the Israelites should serve or minister to one another. How did the Israelites minister to one another in the Old Covenant? Under the Old Covenant, the Most High God established tithing. What are tithes? Deuteronomy 14, 22. Thou shalt truly tithe all the increase of thy seed that the field bringeth forth year by year. Tithes were never money, but the Israelites were commanded to give a minimum of 10% of their, their crops that they grew each year. Deuteronomy 14, 23. And thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose to place his name there, the tithe of thy corn, of thy wine, and of thine oil, and the firstling of thy herds, and of thy flocks, that thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God always. Tithes were all, also wine, oil, the firstling of your herds, and your flocks. Titan was just, Titan was not just given, it was a way to show love to the to our God and our people. The Israelites have also brought the tithes before our God and ate before him. Deuteronomy 14, 27. And the Levite that is within thy gates, thou shalt not forsake him, for he had no part nor inheritance with thee. Also the tithes were for the Levite who was in service to the Most High, making sacrifices on behalf of the Israelites, taking care of the temple. They did not get an inheritance of land nor did they have time to tend to a herd and flocks or raise crops. They didn't have time for all of that. You, you, got, you got Levites daily accepting, accepting sacrif uh, performing sacrifices for sinful Israelites daily at the gate. You know, I did this wrong. They confess, you know, you know, it was similar to what the Pope does, you know, what, what, the, what the the Catholic Church when they hear that boo, forgive me, Father, I have sinned. No, the Levites were, they was, you know, not set up like that in no booth. But when when they uh, when the Israelites sinned, they brought it before the Levite, and he'll tell them what his sin was, and they'll kill the animal together because the the, the uh. The sinner would have put his hand on the on the animal's head or something, and the Levite would sl uh, slit his throat. 
and put the blood in bowls and stuff like that and sacrifice the animal, you know, and, and you know, some of the bowl, some of the blood, and then some of the blood he'll just sprinkle out, and they'll get rid of that the other blood. But the fact is, they they uh sacrifice that animal. So uh, so the fact is. They would they would uh, sacrifice that animal together. Deuteronomy fourteen twenty nine and Levite, because he had no part nor inheritance with thee and the stranger. Now this is what the tithes went for: the Levite, because he had no inheritance, and the stranger, and the fatherless. And, and the widow, which are within thy gates, which are within thy gates, where am I at? shall come and shall eat and be satisfied that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the work of thine hand which thou doest. Now, I don't see none of these churches who collect in tithes providing any type of uh, ministry where the uh, I don't. I don't see them providing any type of ministry where where they're providing food and stuff and housing for the fatherless, education and stuff for those people, so that they can go to school and get a good a good uh, stance on life. All the money that they're co collecting, they've collected billions and billions of dollars as a, as a whole, and if they could they could have. All types of programs to, to advance our people forward. But see, the fact is, they want to have their enemies sitting in that church. You know, it's just like it's just like these Negroes once they got out of slavery, inviting all of these white folks into their house for, for Sunday dinner. And the stuff that the the, the uh, former slave master, now they now their employer, giving them for free. You know, like the chicken wings and. The, the backs of the chicken, you know, even even though we weren't supposed to eat it, but the chitlins and all that stuff, they gave that stuff to you for free. You know, the, the stripped steak that they were giving the Mexican for free because they just cut that stuff off. It was byproduct. They didn't eat it. The pig feet and the and and, and the, you know the oxtails, all that stuff was. They did not eat that stuff. That was mostly byproduct. They didn't. They didn't eat it. But then they they came over y'all house and y'all just cooking it all good and stuff. And people were like, damn, shoot, we giving this away for free? No, we not giving this away free no more. They gonna have to pay for this. Uppity Negroes. Now, just because y'all got these white folks sitting in your churches, and yeah, they they are. Uh, they are overpowering the till because they put most of their money, so the preacher got to listen to them. You know, if the, if the, if the, if these white folks sitting in your church and they want to put all their money in and they want to come on the back say, hey, you know, uh, uh, what I would suggest you do this, this, do this. Oh man, I ain't, I, look, this is the church. This church is for us now. If you if you want to come in and you want to uh, bless us with your finances, all praises to the Most High. But don't ever come in here and tell us how to run our church. We could do without. We, you know, I was broke before this. We was broke before before you showed up. But you know, we ain't spending all all, all the money. We we being frugal with it. But you know, no, we're not gonna do it. We're gonna do it this way. Cause that's that's what that's what a lot of that's what a lot of Edomites do. They'll come they'll come in your church, and they next thing you know, you be running the church. The way they want you to run it. You alienate yourself from your own people. 
You be charging your own people five, ten thousand dollars to sit down and have have lunch with you, break bread and and be able to talk to you and and and, and, and things like that. And when Christ himself particularly said in Matthew 20 and 25, we don't do the stuff that way. The Levites who were in service to the Most High God were fired, and Christ became the new high priest under the new covenant. However, the tithes also took care of the strangers from other tribes who visited and have run out of resources for the young men and women in the community without a father, the widows that are living in the community. The tithes were for a lot of things. It was not just for the Levites. All the things that are going wrong in our community today, the tithes took care of. All these young men and women without fathers, all these bastard kids running around without fathers and stuff. You got you paying enough tithes that you can open businesses and and and, and change these kids' uh, direction and which way they flowing, you know, in this dope and drug game. You can invest in your own children, your own people. But none of y'all investing in your own people. Did Christ have his disciples ask for tithes? When Christ sent out his disciples to his people, what instruction did he give them? Matthew 10 and 5. These twelve disciples, these twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans, enter ye not. The Samaritans was the northern kingdom of, of Israel. He didn't want us going into Samaria at that time because he hadn't died. His death would adopt those those people back. During this time, the Samaritans were also Gentiles. Christ told the disciples not to go to the Gentiles and Samaria. They were Gentiles too. If, if he just wanted to say, go not by the way of the Gentiles, he would just, you know, if Samaria was Gentile, but he said he made it specifically plain. Don't go to the Gentiles, which is of the other nations, and Samaria, which are your, your nation, but, but my father had divorced them. Matthew 10 and 6, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He told the disciples to only go to the Jews. When did he tell the disciples to go to the Samaritans? When did Christ instruct his disciples to go to the Samaritans? Christ never told his disciples to go to the Edomites, Ammonites, Moabites, Ishmaelites, etc. Especially when these nations were pursuing and killing them. What sense does that make? Another question that I might add, did Christ ever go to the Arabs, Chinese, Japanese? I'm just saying, did he ever go? Did, did you ever hear him say he went to the Far East, to China, to the island nations of Japan? Christ didn't go. He only went to where we were, to, to where the blacks were. Apostle Paul went to where we were too, but we were being Hellenized in all of those areas of of. Uh, the fee, Ephesus, you know, Corinth, you know, the Romans was, we were, you know, we were in the Roman uh, areas. Nehemiah 2 and 20. Then answered I them, then answered I them, and said unto them, the God of, of heaven, he will prosper earth, us, therefore, we, his servants, will rise and build, but ye have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem. This was told our enemies around 445 BCE when Christ had Apostle Paul reorganize the church. The other nation had no memorial in Jerusalem. There was no memorial that they had in Jerusalem to come back to. So, 
if Paul was reestablishing the church, it was for the behalf of those people that had a memorial in, in Jerusalem. They were instrumental in destroying the nation of Israel and enslaving them. Psalms 83 and 4. They have said, Come and let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. Christ is telling them to go to that, those nations. The question that Israelites should be asking themselves is, are you worshiping the God of Israel? Or are you worshiping your enemy's God? Why does your actions contradict the words of the Bible, the words of your God. Esau, Ishmael, Moab, Ammon, or Ham have no inheritance or memorial in Jerusalem. These nations don't have no memorial, so why are you sitting next to them worshiping a God that you don't know? Acts 1 and 4. Now this is Christ when he came back upon the scene after he after he was resurrected resurrected acts 1 and 4 and being assembled together with them commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem but wait for the promise of the father which said he ye have heard of me after Christ resurrected and was gathered together in Jerusalem with the disciples and followers, he commanded them not to depart Jerusalem until they received the Holy Ghost from his Father. Acts 1 and 4, for, the, for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. In this precept, suggest, is this precept suggesting that baptizing by the Holy Ghost replaced the baptizing by water? Yes, it does. Water baptism and Holy Ghost baptism. There's the difference between baptizing with water and the baptizing by the Holy Ghost. You must learn and know these things. Matthew 3 and 1. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. The Israelites today are supposed to be in the wilderness, wilderness, the concrete jungle. They're not supposed to be preaching the same doctrine as the Pharisees nor are they supposed to be acting as the Pharisees. I'm not referring to the Christian church because they are not worshiping the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but Satan. If you are in the wilderness, you are supposed to be preparing for the return of Christ. The Pharisees taught the law but did not know Christ. John the Baptist was a Jew in the wilderness, but not joined to the Pharisees and Sadducees. I ain't joined to them either. Like I said, I, I don't you know, I'm going to stay in the wilderness, you know, stay off the radar. Matthew 3 and 6. And were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. Baptism by, by the John the Baptist was done before Christ died for the remission of sins. So, this precept tells you that baptizing by John the Baptist was done before Christ died for the remission of sins. Christ came because animal flesh was no longer accepted from the Levites. Malachi 1 and 10. Who is there even among you that would shut the door for naught? Neither do ye kindle fire on mine altar for naught. I have no pleasure in you, said the Lord of hosts. Neither will I accept an offering at your hand. At this moment right here in Malachi, the Most High God was done with the Levites. He wouldn't accept no more sacrifice. So when the Most High God sent John the Baptist in the wilderness to, to baptize uh, 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 Jews and confessing their sin without, without an animal sacrifice, it was because the Most High God had, had rejected animal sacrifice. And the things that they were doing in Jerusalem in the temple. That was no longer the Most High God. He, he didn't want, he didn't, the Levites were voided out. They, they, were, they were 
taking on a role that they no longer were employed, were asked to do. They were no longer asked to do that role. The Most High no longer accepted animal sacrifice from the Levites after Malachi. The Pharisees and Sadducees were following after the tradition of men, not after the Most High and Christ. Similarly, today, many Israelites are following after the tradition of men with the leather J doctrine, the name doctrine, or you must say the same thing, which are modern day, which are modern day Pharisees and Sadducees doctrine. Christ came because blood is required for the remission of sins, and the baptism of John the Baptist was a temporary solution. Hebrews nine and twenty two. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. Each covenant that the Most High God made with the son of Jacob, with the sons of Jacob, blood was required for the forgiveness of sins. Matthew twenty six and twenty eight. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for remissions of sins. Christ is now the re mediator. You must go to him, use his blood in his name to ask for forgiveness of, sin, of the Father for breaking or transgressing against his covenant. John 14 and 6, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So when you say in the name of Jesus, that's going, back, that's going through Christ. You're going to the Father through Christ because you can't go... You couldn't go in the old covenant to the temple with your your sacrifice and cut the throat and just throw it on the altar and say, yeah, that's for me, God. You know, you had to go to the Levite. Levite cuts his throat while you hold the head and, and he makes the sacrifice. He, you know, because Levites were, Levites were chefs more or less because they know how to, they, they, they knew how to dissect that animal, cut it up. They take their high, they, they they put the high piece on on the altar, and they take the front front quarters of the animal. They take the the hind and the the, the fat around the uh, the kidneys and stuff. Get rid of the kidneys. They didn't they didn't cook the kidneys, and they took took that the hind quarters, and they put that on the altar. And see, at one time I thought that they uh they burnt the animal, burnt that 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 meat. No, they didn't. They cooked it because once they finished sacrificing, all the Levites were uh, that were in the temple at that time could eat that. That was their meal. Okay. The blood of Christ is how you ask forgiveness of the Father under the New Covenant, New Testament. Under the Old Testament, blood of lambs, goats, and bulls were required for the remission of certain sins. The Holy Ghost also had a role, but it was not the remission of sins. John 14, 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. The Holy Ghost is your teacher, not camp doctrine. True, one needs a teacher, but the Holy Ghost is your instructor, showing you the kingdom of heaven and how to establish Israelite communities on earth, the way that our God commanded the Israelites to establish it. If you're not allowing the Holy Ghost to instruct you, then, men, then man has become your God. Whether you want these camp leaders or not, I'm, I'm saying the fact is, the Holy Ghost is the, is your instructor. Yeah, the camp camp instructors supposed to, they, they teach you. Schools are, 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 are good for good for some 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 things, but see the fact is these camps want to just want to come in and take in control of all your life where the Holy Ghost can't sit with you. They want to take over your mind and. You do this, you do that, you do this, you do that, and you don't have a mind of your own. So you're not following after the Holy Ghost, you're following after after man. 
you need, yeah, I can say if you if you part of a, a camp, camps need to allow you to rest and study on your own. Show you some ways and then let you study on your own. If, if you're if you're truly trying to get into the word of the most high God, you can't be driven by man the whole time. You got to be able to study, you know, because you got to sit down and study to show thyself approved. You can't be sitting down and and, and uh, thinking you're reading, reading uh, precept, but you're reading precept with somebody else. Now, y'all get together and read precept. That's cool. But when is the Holy Ghost going to sit down with you and teach you? You know, you need some me time, some time to get within the scriptures and say, you know what? And 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 still and still your mind when when things come rushing to you. Acts one and six. When they therefore will come together, they ask of him, saying, "Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel?" Hmm. When Christ returns. The disciples know that he is coming to restore the kingdom back to the twelve tribes of Israel. Second Ezra 6 and 9. For Esau is the end of the world, and Jacob is the beginning of that of it that follow it. Christ is returning to put an end to this world that is controlled by Esau and return the earth back to the sons of Jacob, the rightful owners. Acts 1 and 6. But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come unto, upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea. Now, see, this is when it changed. When the when when the, the Holy when you receive the Holy Ghost, Christ is telling them, when you receive the Holy Ghost, you're gonna be a witness to Jerusalem, all the cities of of the Jews, Judea, which means all the cities of the Jews. And in Samaria, all the northern kingdom cities, and up to the othermost parts of the earth, to wherever we at. Othermost parts mean all the places we are. Now, he didn't say, I don't see him say Gentiles. Because in Matthew 10 and 5, he said to don't go to the Gentiles and to Samaria and to the not. But here he said, go into Samaria. Because when Christ died, his blood adopted the Samarians back. The utmost part of the earth is where we were. After receiving the Holy Ghost, Christ instructed the apostles and saints to be a testimony to the Jews in Jerusalem and the cities of the Jews, to the northern kingdom of Samaria and to the othermost part of the earth, wherever the Israelites were scattered, which is evident in the following precept in the next chapter of Acts. Now, let's look at the othermost part of the earth, because the fact is, right, you know, the most like this this Bible is, is when the Holy Spirit is with you, it becomes easy to read, easy to understand, because everything is linked perfectly together. Acts 2 and 8. And how here we every man in our own tongue. Wherein we were born. Here's the other most parts of the earth. After the followers of Christ received the Holy Ghost, they began speaking in the languages where the Jews were living in the other most parts of the earth. Acts 2 and 9. Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers of Mesopotamia and in Judea, and Cappadocia, and Pont Pontus, and Asia, along with Jerusalem and Judea, there are the lands that the saints, the apostles, the disciples visit. These are the lands, these are the lands that the saints and apostles Acts 2 and 10 Phrygia and Paphlia in Egypt and in the parts of Libya 
about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, all these people, including Edomites of the Roman Empire, heard the followers of Christ who remained in Jerusalem speaking all of these languages when they received the Holy Ghost. They spoke all the languages that their people spoke during that period. Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongue the wonderful works of God. Now, when they say Christ spoke, uh, uh, what do Arabs speak? What do Arabs speak? Arabic? No, Christ didn't speak Arabic because when the Jews received the Holy Ghost, then they spoke Arabic. Acts 20, you know, I'm going to tell you, it, it gets so easy when, when, you, when you get some understanding in this Bible. It, it just it just gets easy with with people where Christ was at, with, was Muslim. No, he wasn't, because there were Jews that were living in the, in those areas when they came back. This was uh, during Pentecost, fifty days after the Passover, it, which required every every Jew male every Jew to come to uh, Jerusalem during that time. So I think they call it Feast of Weeks or something like that. It don't want to require three holidays that were required for all the Jews to come to Jerusalem. Now, they heard them speak Arabic in their language. Christ wasn't a Muslim. He spoke Hebrew. That's, that's, that's another thing. Okay, Matthew 10 and 7. And as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is exactly what Christ told his disciples to do when he first sent them out from among him, except that he expanded the audience to the northern kingdom of Samaria and to the Israelites in the othermost parts of the earth. Christ did not visit these areas because his death was required to adopt them back to the fold. He didn't visit all these areas. He stayed in Judea. Now he went up past Tyre and Zidon because you know according to his gospel he, he met a woman coming out of, out of Tyre. You know Lord, Lord my, my, my daughter is vexed with the devil. Now he went up further north of Judea you know I don't even think he went into, yeah he did go into Samaria John 4 when he met the Samarian woman at the well of uh, the well of Jacob. So he went up where we, we were the Jews were in those lands. But he did not go outside of the lands uh, uh, that the Most High God gave to us. Christ did not visit these areas because his death was required to adopt them back to the fold. So it, it didn't make any sense for him to, to go visit these people. Adoption was required for many of the Israelites. If you understand the era, during the Greek captivity from 332 BCE to 65 BCE, many Jews who were living in Greek provinces were forbidden to celebrate their holy days, circumcision, and making sacrifices to their God. The northern kingdom of Samaria was were divorced by the Most High God around 720 BCE, and he sent them into the Assyrian captivity. Ephesians 2 and 2, wherein in time past ye walk according to the course of this world, 
according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. The prince of the power of the air. The working in the children of disobedience to mean all of all of the children of disobedience. First, let us identify who Apostle Paul was referring to. If you are a Jew or Northern Kingdom Israelite, were walking according to the world during the things of Satan, then you then you repented and returned to the Most High God through the blood of Christ. Then this is referring to you. All of us were in the world, but. Christ chose us and took us out of the world. And now those in the world, including your own family, hate you. John 15, 19. If ye were of the world, the world will love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hated you. The world loved his own. All the Christian pastors or bishops who are teaching a worldly doctrine, such as prosperity, are received and loved by the world. Everybody loved T.D. Jakes, Crystal Dollar. Everybody loved them people. You know, because T.D. Jakes go to more white churches than a little bit. I don't ever, hardly ever see him go to black churches, but he go to those churches, those big mega churches, and he, he sell the house out. Money galore. Ephesians 2 and 11. Wherefore, remember, now this precept is most important understanding the doctrine of Apostle Paul. Let me say it again. Ephesians 2 and 11 is most important understanding the doctrine of Apostle Paul. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. Now, there were Jews living in Greek provinces and northern kingdom Israelites who were not living according to the law. They were considered uncircumcised in the flesh because getting circumcised in Greek provinces could get you killed. Second Maccabees 6 and 8. Moreover, there were they went out of decree to the neighboring cities of the heathen by the suggestion of Ptolemy against the Jews that they should observe the same fashions and be partakers of their sacrifice. We look at Ptolemy, fifth Epiphanes, king of the Ptolemaic Empire, ruled from 205 to 180. I got a source that I'm probably going to leave in my uh, this class link. Ptolemy was a Greek king. Well, the Greek king that sent out a decree against the Jews living in his provinces. Ptolemy was a Greek king that sent out a decree against the Jews living in his provinces that they should all abandon their laws and become Gentiles and worship the same gods as them. Currently, the majority of the Israelites are Gentiles. The majority of the Israelites are Gentiles because they are worshiping the same gods as those who rob them of themselves their culture, land, language, cre creations, etc. Second Mac Maccabees 6 and 9. And, and whoso would not conform themselves to the manner of the Gentiles should be put to death. Then might a man have seen the present misery. Many Jews were forced to be Gentiles. They were Hellenized. They did not know how to speak Hebrew. Neither kept the Sabbaths. New moons or ancient feast days. This is identifying the Gentiles acting Jews today who are Americanized, acting in accordance with the world. How does the God of your forefathers feel about Israelites loving the world? James 4 and 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? 
whosoever therefore would be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. When the Israelites are loving the world, they are committing adultery on the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and have become his enemy. He is watching you cheat on him with other gods, but you want to come and pray to him. I, I, I don't understand that piece right there. You want to, you you out there in the world just cheating on your God and he just watching you with, with in fury and anger, putting you and your sons and everybody to death. And then you want to go to him, you being disobedient, worshiping other gods, and then you want to put your hands together and bow your head down and pray over a Thanksgiving or a Christmas dinner. I don't know whether to laugh or cry. No, no, I, 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 I beg your pardon. I, I said Ephesians two and eleven. Ephesians two and twelve is the most important one. Circumcision, yeah, that's cool, but you know, but this one is the most important one. Ephesians two and twelve. That at that time you were without Christ. Now it tells you that you were without Christ. At the time when you were in your sins doing all kind of wicked stuff, you're, you're, you are without Christ. Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Now, if you, if you get some uh, assemblies or understanding of this precept and you put it into your common day life today, when you're without Christ, you're without God. You're without the law. You are alien from the commonwealth, from the nation. Because without the without the Christ and the law and the covenant, you've been separated from the covenant. When an Israelite is without Christ, he is he or she is a foreigner to their own nation, a stranger to the covenant, not knowing the ways or the will of your God, hopeless. And powerless without your God. You are relying on the gods of another nation to save you. They are not your gods, nor will they save you from your God. That's that's what that's what it looks like on the outside. On the uh, on the inside looking out. Because you're relying upon another nation, God. You have become alien from the commonwealth. You are a foreigner to your own nation. And you are separated from your laws. Ephesians 2 and 13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Now Christ's blood adopted you back. Now you can come near and become a member of the commonwealth, of the nation again. You're no longer separated. Or a foreigner to your own nation. Most 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 Israelites need to come to, to grips and understand that you are foreigners to your own nation, because the nation that you that that uh, the Most High God created had laws. If once you are separated from them laws, you are separate. You become a foreigner to the Commonwealth because the Most High God kicks you out. He don't want you around him. Christ's blood adopted Gentile acting Jews and northern kingdom Israelites back into the commonwealth. You must first repent, confess your sins, believe on Christ, and ask for forgiveness in the name of Christ. Baptism with water no longer saved an Israelite. It was a temporary fix until Christ died because blood is required for the New Testament. There's no, there's no covenant, there's no covenant that blood is not required. Matthew 10 and 8, heal the sick, cleanse the leapers, raise the dead, cast out devils freely. Ye have received, freely give. Now Christ didn't tell them to ask for money in the new covenant. There ain't no such thing as tithes. Christ established his disciples in the same manner that the Father established Israel on how we should love one another as we love ourselves to eat, to help each other in the face of all this turmoil that the nation of Israel has been suffering at the hands of their enemies. 
Matthew 11 and 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence and the violent take it by force. The violent take everything by death by force. However, the few, the few in the Edomite kingdom who has no influence to prevent the violence and destruction of Israelite people are stopping their people from taking other people's things, killing Israelites, stepping over dead bodies, and taking their property. I have not identified any good Edomites because the net effect of their nation is evil. Now, there's, there's some what we call cordial good Edomite people, but the net effect is they, they ain't making a change in regards to stopping all this evil from happening. You know, because a lot of them that be out there protesting and stuff, they're billionaire children, millionaire children. Inf uh, you know, their parents are influential, influential in, in, uh, in the world. They ain't going to go to their father and say, Father, I don't want you doing that. Don't, I'm going to just, you know, you can disown me. Some of them have done that, but the majority are not. Or they parents give them a stiff thing, you know, either you do that or, you know, I'm going to disown you. I'm going uh, uh, to take that apartment, that uh, condo that I, I bought for you, paid for you. Uh, you are, you're not going to get no more money. I'm cutting you all the way off. And when they do that, I'll tell you what, I can't, I can't hang with y'all no more. Matthew 10 and 9, provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses. If the preacher, reverend, pastor, and bishops were walking in the, in the instructions that Christ gave to his disciples, then over 99% of them would not be in the ministry of the Most High God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or Christ. I surmise that they are serving another God using trickery of words and smooth speech pretending to serve the God of this Bible. Telling these greedy men that they cannot ask for money, the majority of them will leave off being a minister of self. They, they, you tell them you can't ask for no more money. This is no longer a money ministry. You can't get no money. We'll, we'll put you in a economy apartment. We we'll give you a, an allowance. You know you got. Two pairs of shoes and five outfits. And every every one of y'all get a Ford Escort. <laughs> a Volkswagen bug. Matthew ten and ten. North script. For your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet stage for the workman is worthy of the, his meat. If today's preachers, minister reverence, had to prove that they are chosen of God through healing, casting out devils, teaching the laws, etc., then there will hardly be any qualified to stand before the people because most are in the business for the money. Matthew 20 and 28. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Christ did not come to his people asking for money or to be ministered asking for expensive bottled water, peeled grapes, or other expensive items. Christ came to serve. He taught his disciples to serve. He didn't come... With, with, with demands before he came to the church, you know, you know, he didn't come with a, a menu fit for a king, you know, I want, you know, ribeye steaks and fried chicken and collard greens and sweet potatoes and such and such this, and, you know, I want a big banquet spread before me when I come, enough to feed 20 people. He didn't come with that kind of, uh, the man.
None of these bitches and ministers are serving anybody except themselves. Who specifically did Christ send apostle to minister? I, I prepared a lot of groundwork showing who were foreigners from their own nation separated from the covenant which was only made to the Israelites. I'm going to say Apostle Paul to minister. Acts 26 and 7, unto which promise our 12 tribe instantly serving good, in, instantly serving God day and night, hope to come, for which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I'm accused of the Jews. Apostle Paul is being accused of the Jews, those of the circumcision, for doing the work to bring the 12 tribes of Israel, not only in Jerusalem, Judea, but in Samaria, and the utmost parts of the earth. Those who do no, do not understand this fact, do not know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or Christ, nor do they have understanding of the beginning. Acts 26 and 17, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles to whom now I send thee. The Gentiles are those Jews who were alienated or separated from the commonwealth and the covenant. It is important to understand that if Apostle Paul were sent out today, he would go to so-called blacks, Hispanics, Native Americans, those of the diaspora dispersed over the othermost parts of the earth, a product of the sub-Saharan and the transatlantic slave trade, teaching the gospel of Christ so that they might return to the covenant and be saved. Acts 26 and 18, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins. See, in, in all, when he said delivering from the people and from the Gentiles, and then the, 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 the next precept, when he say forgiveness of sins, then you know it's just talking about a specific group of people. Everybody cannot sin. and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Now this is Christ speaking. Apostle Paul instructed to turn those Israelites who are walking as Gentiles away from condemnation and back to the light, which is the law. Proverbs 6 and 23, for the commandment is a lamp and the law is light. So he was telling them to turn them back to the, to the law. That would make some Gentile when you when you're not doing the law. You know, a Gentile usually it means a non-Israelite group. But if you are walking contrary to the law, you're a Gentile, whether you are of Israel or not. Acts 26 and 20. But showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should re repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. This precept explained the previous precept that Apostle should Apostle Paul should go to the southern kingdom of Judea he should go to the southern kingdom the southern kingdom of, Ju of Judea the Jews of, and the northern kingdom of Israel teaching repentance and then to the Gentile the Gentile just a, just a Samaria because Christ didn't tell what in, in Acts 1 and I think 1 and 8, he already identified who the Gentiles were. The Samarians. See, the fact is, when people when people don't understand, 
this Bible, they, they, their spirit is not in this Bible because they've been so involved in all these camps and then they stop believing it in, in, the, in the New Testament because they don't have no understanding when, they, when, when, when they're saying Gentiles, go to the Gentiles and all this stuff. They don't understand the Gentiles use the mean non-Israelite a group. But not always. The root four and three. Give not thine honor to another, nor the things that are profitable unto thee to a strange nation. So if if, if the most high God was telling Christ was telling, if he was telling the Apostle Paul to go to other nations, he'd be going against his word. Christ don't go against the most high God's word. Acts 26 and 21. But th these caused the Jews caught me in the temple and were about to kill me. A promise to the 12 tribes of Israel is still in dispute today because many believe that Christ died so that everybody can receive the kingdom. How can that be so when the God of Israel hates the world which is controlled by the nations? Let me read that again. A promise to the 12 tribes of Israel is still in dispute today because many believe that Christ died so that everybody can receive the kingdom. How can that be so when the God of Israel hates the world which is controlled by the nations? Did the Apostle Paul really go to every Gentile nation? Did he really go to every Gentile nation? There is not one precept in the Bible that shows the Apostle Paul going to the Far East or going to the island nations of Japan or Vietnam. What Gentile did Apostle Paul go to? Let us get some understanding. Because the fact is, you know, a lot of y'all a lot of you guys say things that is not supported in the Bible. Romans 9 and 3. For I could wish that myself were cursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Apostle Paul is wishing that he could suffer the same way Christ suffered for the kin for his kin people according to the flesh. This is not the definition of other nations. Israelites are not related to Chinese, Japanese, Hamites, Arabs, etc. Romans 9 and 4. Who are Israelites? To whom pertain it, the adoption, all the people that were adopted back, those Gentiles, and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. Apostle Paul wants to go to battle and die for his people who are the Israelites. This precept reveals that the, the, that the Christ adopted the Gentiles acting Jews in northern kingdom of Israel who were separated from the nation and stranger to the covenant. The glory or honor belongs to the Israelites. Old and new covenants or testaments belong to the Israelites. The Most High only gave the laws to the Israelites. No other nation has been appointed by the Most High God to be in service to him, except the Israelites. The promises that the Most High made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are for the Israelites. If Apostle Paul knew that all these things belonged to the 12 tribes of Israel, his kin people, then which Gentiles did he go to? Yeah, which Gentiles did he go to? You got to ask yourself that question. If he knew all of these things belonged to the Israelites, and then he turned around and go to all these other nations, what for? That would be a little bit uh, misbehaving. Romans 11 and 1. I say then, had God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. What needs to be understood is during, during this period, the northern kingdom was not considered part of the nation of Israel, nor were the Hellenized Jews. During this time, the southern kingdom of Judah, the circumcised Jews, only considered themselves to be the Most High God's people. And they was protecting that ground. 
the, 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 the Hellenized Jews were the only ones that they that thought that the, where the circumcised Jews were the only ones who thought they were most high God's people. Everybody else was, you know, uncircumcised. Galatians 2 and 7, but but contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. So, Apostle Paul was assigned to the Gentile, acting Jews, and northern kingdom Israelites. The uncircumcision. Circumcision was a covenant between Abraham and the descendants, not among the other nations. And let me take that back. I probably need to just delete this that, that whole line because other nations are part of the circumcision because Abraham's son Ishmael was the first one circumcised. And then, you know, his uh, servants in, in uh, his servants. So Abraham was his, Ishmael was his first son that the Most High God, when he made the covenant, he circumcised Ishmael first. I think Ishmael was like 13 or so. Yeah, I'm going to delete that because that's The law, of the law of circumcision was not a covenant to all nations. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob did not establish the covenant of circumcision between all the nations, but between Abraham's seeds and the strangers who lived among them. Genesis 17, 10. This is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you. I tell you what. I'm going to stop here. I'm going to stop here. I'm going to stop right here because uh, we'll be getting into something else. I'm going to let my lesson continue to flow. We'll we'll start part three uh, at the, the the law of circumcision. You know, the thing about it is when you when you're talking about understanding the Apostle Paul, you have to you have to dive into the old covenant. To give an under, to get an understanding, you know, the uncircumcised and the, un, and the circumcised to understand what was going on. You got to understand the history and understand what understand Apostle Paul, because the fact is, you got to understand a little history of, of the Greek captivity, of, of what made what made Jews Gentiles. You got to understand even back to. Uh, what makes Samarians, the Samaria Gentiles? They were our people. They are our people. They are the northern kingdom. What made them Gentile? And those, those were the people that were in the land still. Not all of Samaria had gone over to this world, to the new world. There were a lot of Samarians in the land during the time of Christ. Because Christ went to the well and he was speaking to a Sumerian woman at that time. And she was like, you know y'all don't have no, do no dealing with the Sumerians. And she understood that they were they were re related because she said, you know, this well was, bu was, was uh, built by our father Jacob. So she knew that her father, her forefather Jacob in Christ's forefather, the forefather of the Jews, were the same people. She knew that they were the same people. But these people were the ones considered uncircumcised by the Jews, by the Jews who were circumcised, who practiced circumcision, who got circumcised, who circumcised their children, and it versus the, the, the Greek, the, the Jews in the Greek provinces, provinces 
who could not circumcise the children because it was a death sentence if they did. It was unlawful in those areas. And the, and the, uh, and the Sumerians were no longer considered Christ's uh, children. He had divorced them, so they were Gentiles in the flesh at that time. So Christ's blood came to, to, to adopt those people back, not everybody, because everybody was not under the covenant. So this is this is what we're going to get to later to understand that those only people that were under the original covenant of the people that Christ came to save, to offer his blood to. He didn't go to the Roman power at the time. You know, he stood before trial. He didn't say nothing to, to, to uh, to uh, whoever the guy's name was, he didn't say anything to him. You call yourself the king of Judah. That's what you say. That's what Christ was telling me. That's what you say. So I'm I'm just saying the fact is, you know, when you put your you, you know you, this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding of all day to keep his commandments, his praises endure forever. That is such a true statement. When you don't have a fear of the Most High God and you don't have a good understanding of this Bible, and, and like I'm saying, a lot of y'all go off, and I can I can see it. And the fact is, I, I just don't have the breath or the time to argue with you. You know, I, I would have, you know, early on, I would have said something, but now I'm like, I don't want to cause an argument and I don't want name calling and get to being slung, slung across the way and everything. I just shut up and keep it moving, pass by. And if it, when it gets too egregious, I just, you know, I don't want that on my page. So I either unfriend them or I, I either uh, unfriend them. I either they don't don't notify me when they uh when they post up. Keep it off my page because I don't want to see it. Is that is that ridiculous? Uh, anyway, it's your host Jeremiah Israel. Please, please don't please remember to uh, like and subscribe to my channel. This is the teaching ministry, so you know I'm not going to be giving you, you no know, high action. Uh, you know, showing showing something. You know, from uh, you know, I keep saying the fact the fact is all these different things. Everybody want you know. The, uh, the, the man of spirit, all this other stuff, none of this stuff is going to work. Most High God is, is is serious about you coming back the way he tells you to come back. Gather yourself together, yea, gather together, O nation, not camp, nation, not desire. Build ye houses, plant ye gardens, that's how you, you, you build your nation. Build your community, one at a time. You know, if you if you buy a large swath of land and, and and your enemy decide they want to move out, you just buy that swath too. And they keep moving out until you over there by yourself, a nation of people. Anyway, um, so my my matches today, understanding the Apostle Paul Part Two. Uh, we're going to get to it at uh, part three on, on uh, the next Sabbath. Uh, then we're going to continue on until, until I, I, uh, I've completed this endeavor. Because, you know, I, I really do want people to understand what the Apostle Paul was, was uh, assigned to do. You know, to get rid of all the confusion. With that family and friends, I like to say shalom. Shalom.